Right, thank you, everyone, for your patience. Um, we had a few technical challenges, but we have now resolved them, so we are ready to go. Um, this session is on evaluating environments and their walkability, and we're going to talk about what makes a walkable place and how we measure walkability and kind of discuss a few different case studies of um, how to do this in practice. Um, I'm Stephen Edwards, and I'm Chief Executive of Living Streets in the UK, um, and we're the UK's um, everyday walking charity. And I'm delighted to be joined by six excellent speakers. Um, I'm going to call them to the stage in turn, and they're going to speak for precisely 12 minutes each, and then... Um, we're going to have some time, hopefully, for questions and answers at the end. So, first of all, I'd like to call up Dr. Stefan Seniger um, from the Centre for Sustainable Urban Development. Stefan. Perfect. And now, how do I start? Just click. Ah, okay, cool. <laughs> I don't see anything. <laughs> so, uh, well, you see the title. I will talk about an app which is called Walkability App, which has a history. So it's a bit about how we got to that second version. <laughs> so what's the idea? What should the app do? Develop a smartphone app, or we will do develop, or we have developed a smartphone app that allows experts and citizens to report their walking experience so that cities can plan for street interventions. So... Looking at the map, man, it's far away, sorry. <laughs> so you see these dots, yellow, red, and green. So the idea is that we, we figure out in some way that there will be clustering, hopefully. So people walk, or, you know, it could be also, we're talking experts, could be that they do a survey with people. So people, people walk, and then they drop pins, basically. And then we hope there's a clustering of red and green spots. And if there's a clustering, if it's a green one, we should go and look why it's green. And if it's red, we should go why it's red. So red usually indicating it's bad, right? So uh, basically the, the, the answer, we, or we search answers for where are problems or where's, where are things good? Uh, who is having an issue? And what's the issue at hand? So pinpointing a bit to a solution. And the who is an issue, so I say here, we think about it, not just the planner, but it's an engineer got told, you know, there's a problem with that crossing, and then the engineer goes to that crossing, and it's like, well, everything is fine. And it's because the engineer is 35 years old and male, and has never, you know, had a, a buggy or something with a child. So per perspective certainly changes. So what, what did we use in the first step, which we called STRIDE, which is an acronym, a very long one, which I don't tell. So in 2018, we started that up, uh, which used the traffic light approach. I say it's so red, yellow, and green. And it basically asks the question, is this place safe? Is this place safe, nice, and easy to walk? So we look uh, at a duality in terms of safety, which is safe versus risky, so green versus red. Uh, street design, nice versus unfriendly. Infrastructure, easy versus difficult. And I actually call just the safe, nice, uh, safe, nice and easy model. So uh, if you look at the image, so it says here, risky, unfriendly, or difficult, basically give or, and here it says safe, nice, easy. So we programmed that, and we did a trial. with. Uh, we did actually five case studies. One of them was in Medellin in Colombia. And I have to say here, so we walked with children, five children in a group, 50 children in total, and each group was with two adults. So one problem, of course, was... Um, should we give the phones to the children? So at some point we're like, maybe not. But it's also a nice idea to, to try if the method or the model, SNE, would actually work in a, in a normal way, in a manual way. So someone was a genius and, and made these faces. It would be happy some, and we didn't just translate it online. And as you see in the map, actually, it worked quite well because we got clusters. So what, what they did is basically they worked... Uh, half a block, and then they did an evaluation. They asked, how do you feel here? And so you see up there to the, the green cluster, so we know everything is fine there. And I said, we, we actually have to go there too, because we have to learn why is it good, right? And then we have the red cluster where we should 
go and think about changing things. So we did five case studies, uh, one in Colombia, with Medellin and in Chile, we did one in Nigeria and in Bangladesh, which I wasn't part of, but we got the, to see the data, it was kind of interesting too. And then quickly if we evaluate, so the where was there, okay, we had a situation, who we knew too, because we asked actually to, to provide a basic profile, but with the what was a bit of problem, as you see in the map, so this one, so there was Lagos. And honestly, I was never in Lagos. So I just got the data and I was like, what's going on there? So I asked people to please send the photo and I got them the photo on the right. Because honestly, I was thinking a bit, you know, it was like a favela or something with no infrastructure, but no, it was like, because it's actually business or, or uh, CBD. So we got sidewalks, but the quality or the maintenance was an issue. So pe people took out the, the, the gully, the lids from, from things and, you know. So we figured we need to improve the app, just looking at that. So we need more information, what's actually going on. So with respect to other information, the when was okay. We, the model did work. The app appeal, so remember, looked like this. It looks nice here, but if you have it on your personal phone, it didn't look so nice. And we had also the problem that decision makers usually use iPhones. So how do you sell your app and, you know, the buses can't install it? So we had also unexpected findings. So one was actually that this manual way did work well, kind of, too. Not just, you know, focusing on app. But also, uh, if you walk in a group with a few people, or neighbors, and you discuss with them, also in a manual way, it reveals a lot of information you would never have got with an, with an app or something, right? So one, one example was really like, you know, we were walking in day and you would say, hey, everything is fine. And then they tell you, no, there's a lot of trucks at certain times. And also in the night times, you wouldn't want to go on the street. Okay, so anyway, we, had an, we know we, we should improve it. So that's what we did. Uh, we got a, a designer to work on the app. We changed a bit the thing. So, so you see now it looks like with, with uh, faces. Uh, it's more a bit of waist style. Uh, the why, we, we added information. So we asked for more information. So we wanted to know why it's a, the person is actually walking. So we have here, so decision, is, is it necessary or choice? Is it transport or leisure? Uh, are you filming all with the environment and actually are you walking with a dependent? So that, that's pretty different too if you walk with a child or with an elderly person. Uh, yeah, so, and then what was really new, uh, we were thinking about how to get more information about the situation without doing photos, uh, because that's a different headache. So we, we decided that for each of the buttons, the red, yellow, green, uh, we also pull up a certain number of situations, so 12, and then someone can, you can press the buttons and do pictograms or press the buttons and say what's, what's applying here. So get much more information. So for instance, so design for people, secure, uh, this is a safe crossing, so it's all green. And this is from the red spectrum, negative. So it's designed for traffic and not for people. There is no path, there's an unsafe crossing. Or you have also insufficient trees and visual. So it's like these three levels or free focus things, safety, nice, and, and, and infrastructure. Uh, and also we added that you are able to, to add comments. We got also information about climate. And then we did the first case study in April. We had one person being so nice and serving. Uh, uh, 58 women agreed. Uh, lots of them actually walking with a dependent. And we collected 420 experiences, but these 420 experiences actually resulted in 700 buttons, more or less, right? So let's then map downtown Dublin. I'm not sure if you realize, so here's the river. And of course not covered because we decided for very certain walks, or we started at tram stops. Uh, and I have to say too, in, in the app, I'm not sure if, you, if it's visible. Actually, in the app, actually, we only show the rings. We don't show the results. So if you have it on your phone, you see only your data, and you would also only see rings to not bias yourself. And saying like, hey, I have been there, and it should be bad or so. So, but here we, we work now at an interface, a web application, 
uh, which shows all the points yourself or maybe from others. So we think about different levels of access uh, and which allows them also to filter certain types of things. So we have here only positive reports by women walking with a dependent. And then I can click on things and see where is positive. And yeah. so that's the idea. So at the moment we work on types of analytics, what to do with the data and need to, to, to get more. So if you're keen on, or will they also workshop? So you could press and then actually if you have a problem in creating an account, which is the first thing, let me know. <laughs> you see me at the conference. <laughs> So, okay. Uh, what questions afterwards you said, right? Yeah. Thanks so much, Stefan. It was really interesting. And certainly in a lot of the work we do at Living Streets, we're really keen on um, getting a viewpoint from people on the street to understand how people are really experiencing the street. And this is invaluable for that. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, next, I'd like to um, call up Ruth O'Reilly. Um, and Ruth is from the Centre for Excellence in Universal Design at the National Disability Authority of Ireland. There we go. Uh, hi everyone, I'm delighted to be here today. So I work at the Centre for Excellence in Universal Design, which is part of the National Disability Authority here in Ireland. And I'm going to talk to you today about work we've done on taking a universal design approach to walkability auditing. And we've done that in close collaboration with Age Friendly Ireland, which is a shared service of local government here in Ireland. Uh, before I go on, I just want to note, I'll be describing any images of my slide for anybody who can't see them. So firstly, just to acknowledge my co-authors for today's presentation, Catherine McGuigan and Emer Coveney from Age Friendly Ireland and Ashley Glynn and Ger Craddock from the National Disability Authority. So including all people walking. We were delighted that this was a key theme of this conference because it aligns very closely with our own work. Um, on screen is a photograph of Ashley Glynn who works and lives in Kilrush County Clare so Ashling is a wheelchair user and she uses an assistance dog, Gina. And one of the improvements made in Kilrush as a result of the walkability audit there was the installation of dropped curbs at a range of crossing points in the town. And the quotation from Ashling is, before the dropped curbs were installed, I had to get a lift to work. Now I can walk to work myself safely and independently. So I just wanted to use this to highlight the impact of removing barriers to walking on our roads and streets so that it can become a choice to as many people as possible. Um, I think to as many people as possible is important to say though, because we know that there are some people who because of perhaps pain or stamina issues will not be able to walk any distance. So we also advocate that accessible parking and age-friendly parking is considered as an important part of walkability. So uh, at our center, we work to promote universal design and that's the design of an environment. Uh, so they can be accessed, understood and used by all people, regardless of their age, size, ability or disability. And obviously our roads and streets form a key part of our environment because they link the places that we, we need to use every day. So that image on screen is of a universal design walkability audit tool for roads and streets. Some people may know it. It was published in 2021 by the National Transport Authority. It was following collaboration with Age Friendly Ireland, ourselves, and with Green Schools. So I just want to show you some examples of the walkability audit process, which informed our collaboration on this tool. And it's a process that Age Friendly Ireland have been using as part of their Age Friendly Towns program. So the definition of walkability that we used in our work, it's the extent to which the built environment is friendly to the presence of people walking, living, shopping, visiting, engaging, or spending time in an area. So obviously taking a universal design approach to walkability is about focusing on how friendly the environment is to all people. So older people, people with disabilities, families with young children. And we promote universal design as a process. So prioritizing the involvement of a diverse range of people in that design process um, is a key feature of universal design. And the walkability audit approach that I'm talking about today is for user-led audits. So with this approach, there's, in fo there's a, a focus on ensuring that the participants in the audits, for example, include people who are blind or have low vision, 
um, families with young children, people with cognitive difficulties, people with reduced mobility. So just to talk a little bit more about the process. So while the participants identify the features in the, in the local area that may cause difficulty for them or that work well for them, a coordinator is required to oversee the process. So they uh, work to oversee it, collate the feedback and write the report. And that coordinator role is an important um, aspect of this approach to walkability auditing. Um, when Age Friendly Ireland carry out these audits, they use typically use the age-friendly program manager in each of the local authorities to carry out that role. Uh, selecting the routes is also a very important first key step. So they're chosen in consultation with local people who know the important streets in an area um, that people want to be able to access easily. So on screen is an image of the routes that were chosen for an audit in the Thai County Mead. So they take in the important commercial, community and recreational facilities. And this at Boy audit had an enhanced focus on designing for dementia. So on the day, the uh, coordinator meets with the participants before the audit and then different groups walk the selected route, take photographs along the way of important features. So I have two photographs here from the um, walkability audit in a tie. So on the right, you can see a footpath that's very narrow. Uh, the person using the rollator in this, in this photograph is on the road because the path is too narrow for them. On the left, we have what looks like a well-designed footpath. It looks to have a generous width. The surface is well-maintained and smooth, and it looks like there's good visual contrast between the edge of the path and the road. But there's a car parked across it, um, and the person in the wheelchair in that photograph isn't able to get by. So that's just to give an example that it's not just design issues that come up in the audits. It's things like driver behavior, um, maintenance, dog dirt, badly maintained hedges that can be a hazard for people. So when the walk is finished, then the participants come back together and they complete the audit tool. And the different headings in the tool are footpaths, facilities, crossing the road, road user behavior, safety, look and feel. And then if there's a school on the route, there's a section for outside the school gates. So there's a discussion then with the participants on recommendations for the report. So during the development of the uh, tool, we carried out a pilot audit in Kilrush that I mentioned at the start. And Clare County Council used that report to apply for active travel funding and they have started to recommend the recommendations. And just to give you a taste for how that works, and we have a short video now um, of that uh, audit in Kilrush. Maybe some audio. Apologies, we may be depending on the captions. Do you want to try again or I can read And I'm also a local resident of Kilrush, so I live in Kilrush and I work as a solicitor as well in the town. I got involved initially through my role as a board member of the National Disability Authority. The National Disability Authority were working with Age Friendly Ireland and the National Transport Authority to develop a universal design walkability audit tool. As part of that process, Kilrush was identified as a town in order to conduct a pilot study of that audit. So I was involved in two capacities, number one as a board member and then number two as a local resident. So I would have engaged with the local community in order to plan the routes that we use for the walkability audit. And I participated on the day also as a wheelchair user. In terms of the walkability audit process, what I think worked really well was the level of community engagement in Kilrush. So it was very important for us that we involved as many people in the community as possible because at the end of the day, universal design is all about people of the community 
and we wanted to ensure that the residents of Kilrush could access the community regardless of their age, size, disability. My name is Karen Fennessy and I'm the Clare Age Friendly Programme Manager working in Clare County Council. So Age Friendly Ireland have developed over 50 age friendly towns now na nationally. Uh, it's based on a four step process of the setup of your community group, um, the, the audit and consultation, which is the walkability audit, then planning your actions and the last step is acting and delivering the actions. My name is Alan Kennedy and I'm an engineer with Clare County Council. Shortly after I got the Kilrush, the, the Department of Transport and the National Transport Authority announced a scheme, the Act of Travel Funding Scheme. Uh, and while it has a number of aims, one of, one of its aims is to improve uh, accessibility to town centres. So I applied to uh, the NTA uh, for funding and that they agreed, I think it was my assessment that it was uh, in, in line with their aims and they gave us funding for it. Uh, and they have given us significant funding I and mean, we have quite a bit of work done. So we're, we're very happy with it. I don't think I'd have got the funding if the walkability on it wasn't in place. We're about 50% perhaps of the way through the walks that we hope to do uh, on the recommendations I suppose of the walkability on it. So what we have done at the minute is we have some footpaths replaced and uh, we have dropped uh, a number of curbs to make them more uh, accessible. We have purchased uh, a number of age-friendly seats that have arborists on the benches so we have four or five of those in. We are also going to uh, put in some yellow boxes and bollards uh, in front of our dropped curb areas to prevent the cars parking and we hope to put in uh, a number of footpaths uh, for example uh, we want to put in a footpath from the brothers of charity home on the Kalima road uh, into up moore street and market square hi my name is amy connolly and i'm a coordinator with the brothers of charity here in Kalrush. As I work with people with disabilities, it's important to us as an organisation to have the town as accessible as possible to make them as independent as possible. As we work with people with gait um, issues or visual impairments, it's important that they are able to step off footpaths um, freely and the likes of drop curbs are very important for that. Now that um, the curbs have been dropped, um, people that we are work supporting and working with can actually access different amenities, um, facilities, the likes of restaurants, gyms, more freely. My name is Sian Mine and I'm from Kirosh, County Clare. It improved for everybody, including myself. I now feel a lot safer, including crossing roads and everything. Because of the improvements of the pathways, it's big safer and easier for other people, including myself. My name's Carol Head and I'm on Clare Older People's Council. We uh, try and get the community how we want it as we get older. Um, because as the saying goes that if you, if you get everything right for the older people, then it will be very well done for the younger people. Public seating in a town, I believe is important because not everybody can manage to walk the length of a street without having to stop. But if you're a bit bad on your legs or if you've got ill health or just sh heavy shopping bags, it's useful to be able to stop about halfway down and you take in the view. I walked into Kibbush this morning with my assistant's dog Gina and there are three footpaths on the route from my home to the office that the draft curb's going to face prior to the walkability audit and that just means that I can now navigate the town in a much safer manner and whether it means going to my office every day or I want to meet my friends for a coffee, going for dinner. And for me, this means that I can now leave my home in the morning and walk all the way to my office with my assistant's dog um, in a very safe and independent manner. So prior to this, I might have had to get a lift to work. You know, Kibrush is a lovely town, it's a great community spirit, um, but it's very important that the residents of the town can actually access it um, and can engage with it in, in a meaningful way. And that's what universal design is all about. So thanks very much, everyone. Um, there's links to all of the items I referred to in my presentation uh, there.
Thank you very much, Ruth. That was some really, really important stuff and some kind of critical themes there around the importance of universal design, really designing our towns and our streets with the needs of all users in mind. Um, next, um, we're going to hear from Professor Stefan van der Speck of the Delft University of Technology, who's going to talk to us about kind of virtual walking for improving walkability. Yes, there it is. Okay. Good. My name is Stefan Speck. Indeed, I'm an associate professor at TU Delft um, Faculty of Architecture in the fields of urban design. And today I'm going to give you a short overview of a project we are doing at the moment in Groningen. Uh, it's a project for urban design, uh, in using urban design for improving health in the city of Groningen in a specific neighborhood. And we're not doing it alone. Um, and what's already said in the, in the main room today, uh, collaboration between different actors, sec uh, stakeholders in the city is very important. In 2018, we started here with a project from the university in Groningen, with the municipality in Groningen, with the health service in Groningen, and together with the hospital in Groningen. So we're not just urban designers who have an idea how to improve uh, the public domain, uh, but 80% uh, of the people involved in the project is coming from health service and a health background. And the neighborhood is, by the way, represented as well with the Wijkraad, but they will participate as well. The area we're talking about for, is the Padapol area. It's a, a 1960s, 70s area, past war uh, neighborhood, as we have many in the Netherlands. And you can recognize it by a big shopping mall, which has a regional function, uh, some high-rise buildings and some stamps, so re uh, repeating patterns in, in housing. And mostly these neighborhoods do not look too bad, actually. There's a lot of green, there's a good accessibility, but <laughs> there are some issues. And that's what we were going to figure out. So the main topic of the research was healthy cities, how to apply healthy cities here. The residents are a very important partner in this. So we ask the residents to participate, to think, to give input. And uh, in, in the first, the second stage, you could say the experts are joining there as well, of course. So, so there has to be a filter on it. We cannot just only ask the residents to say, what is the problem? We also have to filter it and cluster that information. And what is special about this project, and that's why I am, I'm also in, involved, is we're using virtual reality that, for that. So we, we will be testing uh, future designs, possibilities, using in, in immersive environments. So as if you're here. So you're sitting here now. But for example, the people who are following online, I hope people are following online, and you could have a headset and feel as if you're one of the in one of the seats here, and that's what we're doing. And it's not just for fun like this picture. Uh, so we are using real hardware for that. We are using technology, and that's my field. So you have a headset on, it's like glasses, but they are covering your face completely. You have controllers you use to move around because if you're wired to a computer, you cannot just walk with the computer. Oh, by the way, we have a backpack from HP, but it's quite heavy. Um, and you need some additional equipment there. And this is how it looks. So this is one of the sessions where a participant is using the virtual reality to assess one of the environments. Um, the setup, um, first of all, we use the virtual reality to test how did, does the virtual reality work for people? How do they, do they like it or not? How do they understand the current situation? Because if you model the current situation, it's already different from the real situation. So is our model accurate? So that's what we did in the first workshop. A second workshop, we, uh, um, we used the input also on the, uh, the, the, the locations people came up with and the issues people came up with, uh, with uh, uh, design IDs for those locations. So we tested design IDs for the yeah, selected locations with their main issues. And uh, finally, we, uh, with, with the design firm, uh, developed uh, a strategy, we say a concluding design, because the municipality is not going to build it exactly as we suggest. It's coming from the people, it's bottom up, and we have suggestions based on the knowledge we collected. And that's what, well, that's what we call it a concluding design. And we did that twice, so there, uh, there are two cycles for this. The first cycle is the pilot phase, 
in which we only tested the surroundings of the shopping mall and a second phase it was a bigger project with three locations. So in every location, well, this is a maybe a bit complicated scheme, but in every location, it takes time to develop that. So first of all, um, you have to frame uh, the topic. And in this case, the, 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 the post by neighborhoods and, and the location, uh, Padapool, the, 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 the shopping mall. Uh, you have to model the environment. Not everything is available. We, we got PDFs from the municipality, you know, like 2D, like you have the presentation here now, we had to translate, convert those into 3D models and see if those fit. Uh, we had designs by the city architect and in the first round they used all the software for that. So we had to convert them again into gaming software. Uh, we had to test the scenarios with people. It takes a lot of time. Eh? You do questionnaires, you, you have people with headsets on, but you also ask them questions. We, we want to know their background because people have different ages. They have different mobility issues. They may, 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 may be visually impaired. So the, all kinds of information we need to collect as well to understand why they answer a certain question, why they point things on the map, what they think is not good. Yeah. Then there is a synthesis. So we have to reduce all the information you have from different sources into a concluding design. And at the end, we also have to look at that. So the, we have to assess the concluding design as well. And that's what we did twice. So this is the, the shopping mall on the left side. It's the, that's the plan of the mall with the four indicated uh, locations by the neighborhood, by people living in the neighborhood, the residents. And here you see how uh, modeling looks like. Yeah. And this is the real situation. So if I go back, the model situation, very clean, very nice. We added clouds, by the way, because uh, if you usually start this, then it's beautiful weather like in Spain. And, well, we have that sometimes in the Netherlands these days. But so we added clouds. We can also add rain, etc. But let's not influence too much. It was better in uh, in Google actually. <laughs> uh, and and again, the the model situation and people could walk around here. So if you haven't done VR, but VR means really that you're at eye level, that you're walking around, moving around, and it feels if you, if there is a, a curbside. Um, you, 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 you see it, you feel it almost. Yeah. So curbsides was one of the things people really complained about the height of the curbsides and, and those things because they see it. And if you look at plants, they usually say like, oh, uh, the line is not good or the building is too high or, but now we saw lots of reactions on details, the facade, so the eye level perspective, but also the curbsides and the plants. Another photograph, how it, how it worked. We were in neighborhood houses, how it called bird houses. Uh, so in the neighborhood, we were at multiple places during, uh, during the week uh, to collect that information. Okay, and people were really positive uh, about it. So they really felt engaged. They understood what we were talking about and they were able to answer. That was their perspective. Um, well, these, these are the lists of uh, general issues uh, discovered. I, I think those, those, those you, you recognize them. If you are here for a couple of days, you will see these lists. It, it's the, the triangles are there, the attractiveness, the safety, but also the walking and bike, in the, the, the possibly, possibility of walking and biking. And so that was really uh, uh, mentioned by the people. And the solutions, of course, less traffic, uh, so reduce the traffic, sa provide safe crossings, add more green, and add more places to sit. Well, we saw it in the movie just before. So it really, well, same conclusion, isn't it? <laughs> and just to indicate how it looks on the top left, you see the current situation, uh, two times two lanes uh, for traffic. Sorry, we didn't put in the car. So that was one of the questions we, we gave to people. If we put in cars, what is the effect on it for their response to, to the environment? That's still a research question we have. On the top right, you see what happens if you have a bit of paint. Yeah, you can paint a zebra crossing. So in the Netherlands, that works. Then you, you, you will get uh, um, priority. And then on the bottom, there were two extreme scenarios. So take out the road and make a park or take out the road, road and make a square. Okay, and that led to, 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 uh, to a concluding design, and this is the map of that. So I hope you really understand that if you have to look at this map, there's a real difference between this map and what you see here. And that's what we do. But I can tell you that if you're in VR, this is 100% 100, 100 more immersive than what you see here. Still time for phase two, a couple of minutes, Stephen?
two and a half minutes left. Perfect. Okay, so that was the pilot phase. was successful, so we got more money to co continue. And, um, well, then there was COVID. <laughs> So uh, online, we, uh, we had a meeting and uh, we collected information from the neighborhood and from experts and we drew the map where we thought the next locations would be and what topics. So the three locations came out. Well, there are maps again. You will probably not recognize where it is. So on the left side, it's the, the shopping mall. The middle one is a park. On the right side is one of the regular stamps. So the small housing uh, places where there is a space in between the houses. And for every location, we selected topics which were relevant, which were mentioned by the residents or the experts. And based on that, um, we started to, with a design firm to design. Uh, in this case, the, the, the park, you can see uh, there's not much going on. There's water, there's green, but it's not accessible, hardly accessible. Yeah. So how to make it more permeable? So better porosity from the neighborhood, for example. Uh, it's in Dutch. There are all kinds of measurements there. Can also change the structures in the park itself. So add circuits to that, add new paths, add, uh, pro add more programming, and, and, and maybe even add even more. Uh, uh, change the pond, uh, make more connections, make sure that people can really make circuits or uh, enhance the experience of the greens. Yeah. So this way we did different scenarios and showed them to the people. And of course, you also can make drawings of that. The current situation of the pond, so what you see in the drawing here, it looks like a beautiful pond, but it's no more than this piece of green grass. And it seems that people try to park their car there as well. Can you imagine? And you can make sketches how it looks then as well. And at the end, and I think this is also a very important drawing which was mentioned this morning is, it's not only about this park, it's about the integration of this park in the neighborhood. So you have to look at the lines going through. So we start with the park, we draw the lines to the direct surroundings, but from there, the system has to continue. Yeah? So urbanism is not just about uh, pocket parks, small investi of investments, but also about looking at the larger scale integration, connections, etc. That's the story. And if you want to make more, want to know more, yeah, we have the VR facility at Delft. I'm director of the VR lab, so we can give demos to on that and show you how it really feels. Well, that was great. I've, I've seen uses of VR for consultation before, but I've never seen them used in such an engaging way to kind of really bring I new ideas in. So that was really, really good to see, and I might well be tapping up some of your resources at some point. Um, I'd next like to call on Tom Chachaf from um, Possed Max One, who's going to talk about his walkability tool. So, Tom, the floor is yours. Yes, so hi everyone, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm gonna present uh, another walkability tool today, but it's gonna be slightly different than what we've seen until now, as we have a very unique, uh, well, a very precise focus on the spatial uh, indicators that influence walkability. Um, and I'm gonna start my presentation by answering the question, who is we? I'm gonna introduce our office, Postal Max One, uh, a slight uh, build up to why we even want uh, walkability, although many have done this before me during this week and today specifically, so I'll do that quickly. And I'm going to give a quick answer to that question, uh, basically saying that we think walkability is the cornerstone of the healthy mobility transition. Uh, then I'm going to dive into the walkability tool itself and tell, take you through the process of development and the final results. Um, then I would like to share with you an example of how we applied our walkability tool to one uh, case study in the city of Rotterdam. And if time permits, I'll also uh, give you a, a, well, a sneak peek into what we are doing these days with our walkability tool, which is basically a, an exploration of statistical correlations where we try to ask ourselves the question, do certain indicators have a larger impact on the final walkability score than others? So, um, Post at Max One is that strange name you might have seen before. That is the office I work on. Uh, and the reason I want to introduce it because we are a spatial, uh, well, sorry, uh, yeah, spatial strategists and urban designers. 
Um, and that's why uh, everything spatial is basically the core of what we do. We work on scales from uh, the public square designs to regional and national strategy. And we can work across all these scales because we have a nice uh, international team of great, great people um, uh, with diverse backgrounds from urban planners to architects and GIS specialists. Uh, now, GIS specialists are um, the, the core of what I'm going to show you because the GIS specialists form the GIS team uh, who has developed the walkability tool. But first, a question, why do we even care about walkability? Now, a lot of uh, people before me has already made that case, so I will go quickly through it. Um, but traditionally, uh, you might say that cities have developed at a certain pace, at a five kilometer an hour pace. And that had a huge impact on the extent of the built environment. Over the years, new patterns of transport um, and new speeds have basically extended the urban, um, the urban fabric. Uh, this had a huge, uh, huge influence on how we experience our cities. Um, and I've chosen uh, this picture here because it is believed to be the picture of the first traffic jam in the Netherlands in 1955. Uh, and it represents sort of a tipping point from when uh, uh, urban planning, well, it, it started earlier, but it's a symbolic or tipping point of when urban planning has switched from uh, uh, people focused to car focused. Um, but you might ask yourself, uh, probably not here, but people do, why, why is the car a bad thing? It is a great invention. It has given a lot to humanity. Why should we even want to walk? Well, a lot of people have said it before me because we will achieve active cities, livable cities, social cities, safe, sustainable, and prosperous cities. We all know this, I think, in this crowd. Um, that is why in, in our office, and I think a lot of you share this uh, notion with us, uh, we believe that walkability is the cornerstone of a healthy mobility transition. Um, and because every trip begins and ends on foot, um, because cities prosper at slow speeds and high densities, which are the very same characteristics that encourage walkability, um, because walking is inherently sustainable, because active modes of transport, cycling, but also walking, promote healthy lifestyle, this all led us to the conclusion that if we want to work towards a healthy city, we need to start with the necessary condition, which is walkability. Um, at the same time, when you look at the data, uh, you see that our cities are not encouraging us to walk to the extent that we would like. Uh, the pie chart on your left shows the model split in the Netherlands from a few years back on the board this side. Um, and you can see that 47% of trips are still carried by uh, the private vehicle, but only 18% uh, are pedestrianized. That's the top left share of the pie. What is remarkable in this pie, but it's not part of this discussion, is that 27% of trips are done by bike. And that's, I think, unique to the Netherlands, but it's part of a different discussion. Uh, the other pie chart on the right shows similarly how our public space is divided between modes of transport. And you can see that 45% of the public space is dedicated to the private vehicle, plus another 10% for parking these vehicles, while only 33% are dedicated for pedestrians. And that is why uh, we want to act towards improving walkability. Now, this is a bit of a simplistic vision of uh, what, how you can improve walkability. Uh, we've generated a quick five minute walk, uh, actual walk times on the image on your left. And we showed what the potential walk distance could be if you had proper conditions um, for walking. Of course, distance is not the only thing we're interested in, but you can imagine that the gap between the two surfaces that represent the actual and the potential walking could be minimized. Now, having made the case for walkability, uh, I'd like to introduce to you the walkability tool that we've worked on, which is slightly different than what everyone else has been working on. Uh, but how we approached it is, first of all, looking at what other people are doing. Uh, we wanted to see what are the spatial approaches uh, to walkability. And there are some, uh, well, there are several approaches around the world. Um, some of them look at proximity to amenities. Other look at uh, a supply and demand question, where supply is the space for pedestrian and demand is uh, predicted pedestrian flows. Uh, others uh, do an overlay of densities and, and um, amenities. But uh, we came to the conclusion that that is not comprehensive enough to capture uh, the pedestrian experience, at least not to the extent that we want it. Um, and the reason for that is because we can easily imagine that a narrow approach to uh, what walkability is um, 
uh, could lead to situations where you can measure walkability by proximity to amenities, but uh, have those amenities distanced uh, from you by a large obstacle such as a highway. Would a, a neighborhood be considered walkable in that situation? Would it be considered walkable if you have a lot of space to walk, but that space is not safe or there are no destinations to walk to? This has led us to, to believe that walkability is determined by many different factors and the right balance between them. Therefore, it cannot be a narrow question. We therefore uh, dived into the data. Uh, we are a data-driven office uh, and a, a team of GIS specialists loves to work on data. Um, and we started looking for which data sets could best describe the pedestrian experience uh, in our living environments. We did this in an iterative process uh, where we performed some site visits and went back to the data to site visit and having uh, um, consulted literature, relevant literature along the way. And um, through uh, these three criteria of selecting the, the proper uh, data sets of replicability, scalability and accessibility, we've come up with a group of indicators that are, uh, can be well, roughly grouped into three categories of safety, morphology, and livability, all together um, describing to a good extent what, uh, uh, what spatial indicators uh, are for a pedestrian. So based on this uh, carefully selected set of indicators, we evaluate the spatial conditions that determine the pedestrian experience. And what we do is uh, measure the uh, individual indicator score. Um, and this way we can trace back which indicators perform poorly in a certain study area and therefore indicate where improvements could be made and what kind of improvements. Um, we then aggregate our score to provide an overall performance score for each neighborhood. So this is uh, a, a sample of a result for the city of The Hague in the Netherlands. Uh, so basically a selection of indicators are aggregated to give a final walkability score per neighborhood. And the next step for us was to make this analysis into a tool. Uh, and that meant automating the process and then rolling it out to the entire national level, in this case of the Netherlands. And uh, the reason we wanted to bring this automation is because of replicability, one of the criteria we had before. Uh, because once you have an automated process, you can rerun the tool, you can uh, evaluate uh, design changes. Um, and what it also allows you is to um, come up with uh, benchmark values because we have generated a data set of 12,000 plus neighborhoods in the Netherlands um, and all their spatial indicators and how they perform in terms of walkability. This also gives us an easy use in all our design projects. So we can start a design project and immediately consult what the walkability score is in a neighborhood. And it also gives us the possibility to overlay our um, data set with other data set um, in order to understand correlation with other aspects of urbanism. What we uh, then wanted to do was take this uh, uh, national data sets, basically take the tool and publish it um, because we wanted it to be a solution oriented approach. Uh, for that, we created an online application and made it publicly available. So anyone could consult um, the walkability score of this neighborhood or any given study area and click on a specific neighborhood and, and see how the uh, different indicators perform on an individual level. This way, we hope to provide um, uh, data-driven information for different stakeholders, could be communities, politicians, or urban designers such as ourselves, um, in order to uh, promote walkability in a given study area. Now, uh, I'll give you one example of how we use the, uh, the walkability tool in practice. And on the way, I'll also show you uh, two features of the tool. Um, this is an example of a project we did in uh, Rotterdam. Um, these pink clouds that you see on the map represent a 10 minute catchment area from primary school in the city. Um, and what we wanted to do is to evaluate the walkability of those catchment areas uh, from the point of view of uh, primary school children. For that, we wanted to uh, um, adjust our indicators, uh, so apply certain weights to certain indicators, indicators such as uh, road safety, sidewalk width, um, uh, social and, um, social and uh, activity and social control, sorry. Um, and for that, um, uh, and what we found out was that about half of Rotterdam schools uh, cannot be described as highly walkable for children. But at least now, based on these uh, results, the municipality could uh, consult these and see which indicators perform poorly and um, bring forward the relevant action. 
Uh, two features in their tool that enable us to do that is the fact that we can apply adjustable weights. Uh, so we can um, basically decide that if we are looking at primary school children, safety has a bigger um, influence on their chances uh, of walking, especially as parents usually decide uh, if kids will walk to school or be driven to school. And also the fact that we can adjust the study area. Previously, I showed you how we apply all our studies or aggregate them to a neighborhood score. Um, but what we've done here is apply our study to um, the 10 minute, 10 minute catchment walking area uh, from schools. So that gives us adjustability in both scale and um, target group. I don't think I have time for the last bit. No. <laughs> that's a big no. Well, that's it then. For next time. I, I didn't quite expect the end hooters to be so loud and intimidating, so apologies for that. Um, finally, um, we have got um, Darren Croissant and Winnie McDonough from the Pavi Point Traveller and Roma Centre who are going to talk to us about um, walking towards inclusion for the traveller community in Finglas. Over to you. Hello, everybody. My name is Winnie McDonough and I'm one of the primary healthcare workers from Pavi Point. And me and Darren is here. We're after doing a walking project and we're just going to talk you through it. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here this evening. Um, I work with Winnie in Pave Point. I'm the coordinator of our primary healthcare project. And as Winnie said, and as Stephen kindly pointed out, our title of our presentation is Walking Towards Inclusion for the Traveller Community in Finglas. So the aim of our research was to take the National Transport Authority's walkability framework, which Ruth mentioned her presentation previously, to explore the walkability of Finglas, which is an area in northwest Dublin, but from the perspective of the traveller community. So in our presentation today, we're going to be looking at photos that we took along the route and relaying observations that we made and traveller participants along with us made. And hopefully, if the audio works, we'll be hearing some interviews with people as well. Um, and this is all, I suppose, to negotiate the link between social inclusion and the built environment that travellers often find themselves living in. I'm a traveller woman myself, and we have very bad health problems. We suffer, a, a traveller woman lives 11 years less than a settled woman. A traveller man lives 15 years less than a settled man. And suicide is very high in our community. We suffer very bad from heart problems, diabetes, and cancer. My job in Pavy Point is we go out working on the sites and the grounds, and we cover over 300 families, men, women, and children. Thanks, Winnie. And um, the work that we do in Pavy Point in our health team is all around the social determinants of health, which is obviously very much the topic of this week's conference. Um, so we look at things not just from the like end outcome of traveller health uh, in terms of conditions they have, but also in terms of poverty, housing, um, access to equal education, to healthcare. And I think one of the best ways to kind of illustrate that approach in our work um, is to kind of hear when you talk about what she does out in the ground with the community. We work on the sites and a lot of the sites and a lot of the houses and the sites that's on official sites wouldn't have no water, no electric or no toilets. And we get discriminated a lot. A lot of our young people leave school at 15. And when we go looking for a job, we find it very hard because we've left school very young. And our health service, a lot, a health, we get a lot of discrimination from our health service, and a lot of travellers can't read or write. And um, so, obviously, like that's an illustration of some of the social determinants of health that travellers face. Uh, but the one that we're going to be looking at in this particular presentation is around the built environment um, that travellers find themselves residing in. Um, so, this map here illustrates the route that we took along our walkability audit. Uh, we chose this route for a number of, number of reasons. Uh, primary reason being that it obviously, as you can see depicted in yellow, it covers a high density of traveler accommodation, what we often refer to as traveler sites, which is traveler specific housing. So that could be official accommodation, like a group housing scheme. It could be unofficial, it could be a roadside, and um, it could be, you know, there's many different types. It could be travelers living in standard accommodation as well. 
Um, we also chose the route because of the different amenities that we'd be passing by. So as you can see, quite centrally, we were passing through the village. So again, obviously many travelers in the area would have to go to the village, do their local shopping, whatever it might be. And also there's a number of schools and also one of our national hospitals is on this route as well. Uh, we took a good bit of time trying to decide what makeup of participants we would have on our walk. Uh, we wanted to be as inclusive as possible um, and include travelers with additional needs, a diverse range of ages and genders. Uh, but one of the issues we had when we actually started to plan our route was that some of the areas we wanted to go to were particularly dangerous. Um, and Winnie will be talking a little bit about that later on in terms of the lack of footpaths um, on some of the roads where travelers live. So to not be too irresponsible as researchers, we compromised and said that we would take children. So for example, Winnie had one of her granddaughters in a pram. So we had someone pushing a buggy um, and more children of a diverse age and uh, genders as well in terms of adults. But then when we moved to the more dangerous sections, we thought we'd just keep it <laughs> to ourselves and localize the danger to people who had kind of signed up for it. Um, so that was the route that we took. And to move on to our findings, the first thing that we noted was in relation to footpaths and particularly high curbs, which I know has already been mentioned in this session as well. So these two photos that you see here are taken from one specific um, group housing scheme in Fingus. It's actually the largest traveler group housing scheme in the area. It has more than 60 families living there and I think more than 250 traveler residents. So we spoke to individuals living there and they talked to us about the high curbs and how difficult they were to negotiate. Um, obviously, the first image here has a wheelchair. There's no one in the wheelchair, but I'm sure you can imagine that if someone was, it would be even more difficult to actually mount that curb and you know, to enjoy getting out for a bit of fresh air. The second image there is actually the entrance to the site itself. And as you can see, the design of it is quite wide, which allows cars to travel at speed to actually enter the site and to leave it. Um, and some of the elderly travelers that we spoke to said that it was quite difficult for them to walk even from one side of the other to head into the Fingless village just because of how, the width of it and also negotiating the curbs. There's no pedestrian crossing, so that is the only option that they have um, to get to the village. <laughs> so hopefully now we're going to listen to a short snippet of uh, Mary Bridget, who lives on the site and is a carer for her mother as well. So she's just going to talk a little bit about her experience and her mother's experience of negotiating those curbs. I look after my mother. I'm my mother's carer, and she's a wheelchair user and has been for the last number of years. As you can see here in our area where you can see the footpath, it's extremely high. We usually have to push the mother in the wheelchair out of our local bus stop to get out to the local hospital because she has difficulty getting into her motor car. So as you can see here, even if the person is in the wheelchair, it's very difficult to get up in the pathway because it's so high. But what we have to do is come around by one of the houses and kind of come up the driveway. If there's a car belonging to the residents in the house and that's blocking the driveway, we cannot get up in the path. And this is really, really difficult for us. So we have to wait till there's no cars in the driveway, then push up that little bit of a dip come around by the path where we should have been already on it in the first place. And it's that little bit of an extra walk that we have to do. And this is really difficult for myself and for my mother. And my mother gets very much embarrassed because she thinks because you can't get in the path that it's her fault. And it's not. It's just the way that they're made and they're made extremely high. So I think um, Mary Bridget's story there illustrates a lot of decision making that travelers in the area have to make. You know, it should, it should be a simple thing to go for a walk or to enjoy heading out into your local area. But for them, it can be, you know, not as simple as that. Um, so Mary Bridget's story indicates issues relating to footpaths. But what Winnie is going to talk about now are the more serious concerns in which no footpaths actually exist. This is Dunsink Road, this picture on the right. And me and Darren took a walk down it. We decided to walk down and it wasn't that easy, as you can see, to walk on the road. As we were walking down, there was no paths. The trees were out on the road. And when you come to the end of that road, there's a very steep bend. So you couldn't get around it that easy. And there was a lot of cars and lorries coming up. So we had to be very careful to keep coming up and down because the cars and they didn't see it till, they, till you came around the bend. And in this caravan, there's a woman there called... Mary and she lives there. She's there over 30 years and there's 150 family living around there and she's no running water and she's no electric. She's a generator and she's to go up that road and up to the village to do her shopping 
and out the door or work or whatever she's to do and she can't get out because it's very dangerous and when you come there there's an awful dangerous bend as well so it's very dangerous for her and she's a woman and she's not well and she's cancer at the moment so she's going to tell a small bit of her story as well yeah we we'll try to come as quick as we can down the road and i have a problem with my legs and i can't walk too fast and to try and get back down off the road like it's this dangerous part of the road, you see. Yeah, yeah. And to get in here. And then we're saying when we get in here, thank, thank God. But yeah. it's my legs. My legs is giving me terrible problems, yeah, you know. Yeah, And I can't walk as like well, I used to be able to walk. I used to be able to walk up that there in five minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, up to the very top of that road. But how long does it take you now? Well, it take me about maybe 15 or 20 minutes, you know, just to walk up. So that was Mary's story there. And as when he said... You know, we did that walk ourselves. We only had to do it once and we genuinely <laughs> feared for our lives just having to do it that one time. So I can't imagine residents having to do that every day. But as when he says, there, there's at least 150 travellers living just in and around that road. So obviously they have no other choice but to negotiate the roads um, to get around. Um, another thing that came up in the course of our audit was around traveller isolation. Um, so this first photo here on the left depicts the front of that first site that we just showed you there. So if you walk out that side, that's what you're staring at. And that used to be a green field where Mary and her other family members would cut across to actually gain access safely to the Finglas village. And I'm sure enjoying going for those walks. Uh, but when a housing development was erected there, they built a, uh, a fence so to block pedestrian access. And um, so now there's no longer a safe route for them actually to walk to the village. And similarly, the second image there on the right, um, it's kind of hard to see because there's a van in the way, but behind that van, there is a wall. And that wall didn't always exist there. Um, so that's actually the site that Winnie lives on. And it used to be a shortcut, a laneway that would provide safe access for the traveler children on that site to go to primary school, which is connected at the back of the site. But they woke up one morning and a wall had been built, apparently at the behest of the settled residents in the local area. Um, so now the children have no option but to travel by car because it would be too dangerous without that laneway to travel by foot. So again, it's just another example of um, isolation by design, essentially. So to conclude, um, just to say that this is just one audit that we conducted in one area. Um, we know anecdotally that the situation for travellers nationally in relation to the built environment can be very difficult to negotiate. We actually think that what we present here can actually be quite a good example. Um, especially for travellers living in rural Ireland, there's a lot more issues to contend with. Uh, and just to reiterate that the location of traveller sites often compounds existing mental and physical health inequalities that travellers um, are well documented to experiencing. They can be purpose-built to exclude, resulting in car dependency and making it essentially unsafe to walk into local amenities. And again, this is something else that we noticed is the speed of the vehicles in those areas. Traveller sites are often situated near dual carriageways, near, motor, near motorways, where you're contending with very dangerous traffic um, and also contributing to air pollution and noise pollution in the area as well. And then lastly, the lack of green spaces and play areas for children, which Winnie's just going to demonstrate with another story. Uh, this is where I live across the road is our site and we live there and there's 50 houses and there's 30 caravans and we're very overcrowded and we've no play area for the children and we've no green areas. So the children go across this road, but this road is very dangerous because their car speeds up and down very fast. And there's a hospital beside us and there's a school. And as you're going past this road, you come from the Branches Town area down to Fingers Village. So the children goes into that green area to play, but the principal in the school doesn't be happy with them because it's beside the school. But the children really has nowhere else to play and it's very dangerous. Um, so these are just some references if people want to learn more about traveller health inequalities or the profile of Irish travellers in Ireland. And also just to plug that we have an online library that has a wealth of resources that people are interested in learning more. And as well, my colleagues in the audience and also <coughs> wants me to plug an event that our organisation is having on Friday, which is a national event for Culture Night in Ireland uh, that happens nationally. But for anyone who's travelling and is here until Friday, it might be of interest for you if you want to learn more about uh, Irish travellers and Roma culture. Thank you very much. So um, we started late and I'm keen for us to finish on time because I know everyone's got to get ready for dinner this evening. Um, but we have got about, say, kind of 10, 
15 minutes for questions. I've got some on the screen, but first of all, any questions in the room for any of our fantastic speakers? Yes, sir. So question there about whether um, you work with the planning authorities um, when new rail lines go in, I suppose, to ensure walkability um, across rail lines. Any of our speakers got comments yeah, on that in particular? I experience on that. Uh, yeah. I'm involved in the disability uh, user group for Irish Rail. And uh, rail crossings and manual crossings are a major problem, but uh, Irish Rail and TII, Transport Infrastructure Ireland and the NTA, if they're reopening lines, they do massive consults you know, to make sure that everything is as safe as possible. Uh, historically, there are some crossings that would not be considered safe in the modern design, but they're historically the way that uh, they will be changing some of them with the current course. Great, thank you for that. Um, question from uh, Songyu, um, who asks about universal design. He says universal design has focused on wheelchair users, such as um, drop curbs. But are there standard designs which are critical for uh, visual impairments? So, Ruth, perhaps you want to comment on that? Great, thank you. Any other questions in the room? Yes. So um, a question um, for um, Darren and Winnie about the engagement they've had with the council about improvements in their local area. So, um, question online for um, Stefan on Tomo, I think. Um, do you kind of how do you see the potential and usefulness of an automated? audit tool that would pick up the features that are most likely to be perceived as barriers automatically rather than you having to go in there and report them. I think kind of both Stefans I think might have views on that. Who wants to start on that one? Stefan? Yeah, actually yesterday we were doing a walking workshop and someone also talked about the features that we're not having robots looming around <laughs> and identifying objects. I was taking a picture of that and thinking about it. It sounds interesting, you know, but I think it's maybe 10, 15 years or more. No, so I think it's closer. Uh, yeah, so in AI, a lot is done already with pictures. So if you submit the picture online in a web server or in Twitter, you can already assess it. If you know the location, you can put a dot on the map with a specific issue. So it's really close. It's doing things automatically. Mm. Well, I would, I'm not just talking about technology. The problem will be also putting it on the street and then how people react. So that's what I was speaking to. And especially if I put it in Chile on the street, I'm not sure it would be 10 minutes there and then someone has it. <laughs> so what happens if you have automated systems to. Yeah, you mean the robot, but you don't yeah. have a robot. I mean, everyone has a phone. Ah. If you submit submit your photograph in a service where you can grab it from Twitter with, with all kinds of tags and with location. You can assess the photo 
and, and that's it. So I shouldn't, I wouldn't put things on the ground. I mean, everyone in the world has a phone, one or more. So it's there, you can assess the phone, and AI is very strong at the moment. So comment, comment I from... I just wanted to add some context. I yeah. this question. Uh, I just wanted to add some context. I think the use of the apps and engaging with people is amazing, and um, it's amazing to have voices, but it's very time intensive from the people's perspective. And um, I work with disabled people, and there is a bit of survey exhaustion with disabled people. You just keep asking them what is wrong, and then nothing changes on the ground. So I think the point of my question was rather... Uh, I would advocate towards us understanding better what the, physical, what, the, what the features of the environment are that people might perceive as barriers um, and focus maybe our effort in better understanding what are those features and then go assess uh, images in, a, in an automated way. So that's the discussion that I... Um, Do you want to come in on that point yeah, I, as well? I, I do like to want to come in on that because I, I'm very involved in disability access in the urban environment and public health in this country. And I was interested that this is accessible and this is accessible. Yeah, is that accessible for all? Is that universally designed accessible? Or is that, exi is that accessible for people who are able and know? And I suppose we were talking about Rotterdam and how, how zebra crossings are every are trusted. Funny enough, I was talking to somebody a few weeks ago from Rotterdam and she said, Those cyclists don't behave, uh, don't do yeah, exactly. So the reality of disability, disability access, you don't seem to take it any very or how are you taking it away? Because it should be in, in the very first, because disability access is access for all. So you don't seem to have any very there at all. And that's what worries me is that it would be a box ticking exercise at the end of the process. Do you want to, yeah. do you want to come back on that? I, 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 10 years or 15 years ago, I, I wrote an article on this accessibility for all this. this, this is important because then you cover it. So if you make the bus accessible for all, that means that it's not only wheelchair accessible, but also the mother with the kids can access it easily. So it's better to do it in a good way, in a good manner, and not with technology, with buses going down, dipping, and they're broken every time or they don't use it. But here it's the same thing. It's what I showed is this is an example, but we are making a booklet now with all kinds of design solutions. It's not ticking boxes. It's thinking about the whole strategy. And I think especially that we also had different groups in it, we got comments on that. So if the people drawing from the municipality drawing the curbside wrong, they got complaints and it wasn't built yet. The good thing is we could reconstruct it in a drawing. So it cost you two minutes to reconstruct it in a drawing. It didn't cost a thousand euros to reconstruct it in the real world. So I think we can, with what we are dealing mm. with, we can take out lots of issues before that, especially if we have special user groups going through the model with wheelchair. So even in, we were thinking about a project where we were in, where you are in a wheelchair and if you move the wheels, you move in VR, like that, yeah? So integrate those things so you make it, uh, you test it, test it already before you build it, yeah. Yes. I have a question for Thomas. Um, in your walkability mode, how did you take into account um, bird song, greeneries, Yeah, really good question. Uh, some of these intangible uh, elements are somewhat tangible because they can be co converted into geospatial data. So if you have noise pollution data, for example, you can evaluate uh, how much of a certain street segment suffer from noise pollution, air pollution, or lack of exposure to green. And that could be incorporated as a new data to measure uh, the pleasantness of the environment of the public. But is it either tool at is it in Our tool uh, focuses only on air pollution. Uh, that's one of our indicators. So I think we've got time for one more question or point. Yes, Jim. Uh, well, it's just a question about equity, really. We know that the, the areas where we need most help walkability are the places where these tools get used least. And, and so I just wonder, as the people who are developing the tools, and I'm one of these people, I'm too big to do, but um, how can we get people to uh, use these tools where they're needed most? Mm. And uh, how can we take on some responsibility 
but making sure that we're applying them in an equitable way to helping the people that need it as quickly as possible. Because I, it, it's a shame to me that we've got all these answers, but we're putting them in places or using them most to make nice places nicer. Yeah. Uh, so that's the question. Yeah, how great. Do we, how do we stop this or, or how do we get better than this? Really great point. And we see that in our work in the UK as well. Yeah, Tonga. Part of what we're trying to do with uh, measuring mobility for every neighborhood in the country is to be able to uh, have a data driven um, approach and able people to take action where it's needed the most. So you have a data set that, uh, that describes walkability everywhere. You can overlay that with certain populations to say this is, your, uh, this is where you should start. Now, the question of which data set you, uh, you match to it is it depends on what you want to solve. If what you want to solve is for a specific target group, find the data set that that target group, find where walkability is not performing well, and start action there. Um, it, it, the tool, in that sense, uh, ours at least, it focuses on policymakers and urban designers, so it's a bit of a different scale of a solution. But we hope that it can promote um, <coughs> action in a most impactful way. Any other speakers got a comment? that point. Yeah, one, one final point, and then I'll kind of close it up. Just, uh, my name is Sylvester, I work from uh, I don't know. Uh, I just want to emphasize on uh, Jim's question. Uh, so this is a case of uh, my child, once my child has eaten, the neighbor's child is uh, not my concern, and uh, this goes to some of these points. The global South, Africa, Asia, and uh, South America, may not be able to afford some of these goods. I think this is a question of genesis. How do we ensure that we bring up the people mm. who are low, or the areas that are low, to also try to be at some level, so that you don't only talk about the nice places getting better, but the, those that don't have, don't even have anything. Well, the, it's true that the starting point for our tool is having geospatial data. Where that where the data is not available, it's really difficult to, to apply this tool. But there are a lot of um, initiatives that are they're not related to us of mapping the global south where uh, often geospatial data is missing. That could be a first step towards uh, enabling geospatial tools. Well, the, more than 60 percent of people living in, in Nairobi uh, their communities aren't even mapped. There's no map. They mm. don't even exist in the planning system. Uh, there's no communication. I mean, you know this stuff. <laughs> You've been there too. And uh, it, it is a challenge. So, yeah. you know, we're, we're basing tools on, on, ge on the accessibility of geospatial data uh, when, it, when these people have been ignored and, and the system isn't, isn't available to them. That's, that's a huge population mm. of people. And they're the people who want, want these things most. And, and what I've heard particularly about this, uh, this traveling community, it, it <coughs> seems to be that same uh, gap. Yeah. It's here in Ireland, and I suspect it's in every community, if we look at the arts uh, in any country. Where that's a challenging note on which to end kind of around the kind of inequality of our walking spaces as well. And I think there's some great sessions tomorrow that are going, going to go into that theme in a lot more detail. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. It's been a really good discussion, some fantastic presentations and some great questions and discussion afterwards. So I think one final round of applause to thank our speakers. And, um... and I look forward to seeing many of you at dinner later on. Thank you very much.